Okay, this is video number one. I'm with Roger Mabry of Butterfield Farms, Jersey breeder, uh, well-known Jersey breeder uh, in Arkansas. And today we're in Roger's home office. And Roger, of course, is retired from the dairy business. But uh, this is part one of a series of Jersey history videos that I want to do. And I'm starting with Roger because he's a uh, Somebody with a lot of knowledge to share and a lot of history in the Jersey breed and say hi to everybody, Roger. <laughs> and uh, let's just get started here. I was thinking uh, part one here, we'll, we'll talk about how you got started with Jersey's and the dairy business and your career. All right. We can, we'll go back when I was six years old and uh, my dad's father was selling out his little dairy herd and he had bought Guernsey cattle from Can uh, from Wisconsin. And in that sale, Dad purchased a cow we named Josephine. She was a purebred Guernsey. And when she, she was, it became my job to milk her. I was six years old. But I milked her twice a day. And uh, she was in calf to a Jersey bull, so she had a half Jersey, half Guernsey. That one produced a three-quarter Guernsey and that kind of got me into a point where I could sell a little bit of milk and uh, along about the time I was 10 years old dad found uh, one of our neighbors almost relatives had jerseys and some good ones and he had a great jersey calf which dad bought for 50 bucks and it became my project and she did well, won the county fair a couple of times with her, even though couldn't show her the open show, but she won the junior show. That same herd dispersed and they sold a paternal sister to that one, which had been winning at the county shows. And I bought that cow, her name was Pedro Penn Rebecca. And uh, I won every fair I went to that year. I didn't get to go to the open show. Because she wasn't registered? No, she was registered. Uh, had a decent pedigree, but uh, our county agent got a group of us kids together and we had an open top semi-trailer full of project animals. And we went to the state fair and I did my own clip and got the cow ready and everything. I think I was 14 by then and maybe not even that old. But anyway, I got the cow ready and I was able to win champion there at Little Rock, and I beat a cow that was reserve grand at the open show in Dallas. But since we went down late, we couldn't show in the open show. It was prior to the junior show. But that poor cow got to go to a lot of shows, and she had pretty good offspring. And we had a son of her that gave a daughter or two, gave me a daughter or two that was good. And uh, that was the big start. And you had a farm, your folks had a farm in Springdale? We had, at, in Rogers, uh, not far from where I live now, there was, uh, they had 10 acres with a little house on it. Uh, but prior to that, they had another, that's where my first milking went on, I guess. Uh, well, I not with the Guernsey, but with the Jerseys. And, Prior to that, we had another little place that was 18 acres, and then he acquired the 10-acre the place. So I had jerseys on both places. Eventually, the barn was fixed up so I could milk in the one on the the second, the 18-acre place. And uh, I was milking cows there and through high school. I'd get up in the morning and go milk my cows, and I got the superintendent to let me come in early or later I didn't go to school till after nine o'clock, and uh, I'd get my chores done, go to school, and then go back home and get in the car and go to two or three miles to milk cows again. Fed them silage with a wheelbarrow. And uh, were you milking by hand or machine? I started out milking by hand there, and I got up to about eight cows, I think, and uh, got a machine bought and uh, bucket milker. Uh, there's those there's a surge surge single type machine lots of fun those are the worst <laughs> <laughs> we 
the uh, but I'm up there for oh quite a while till I was picked, well the year I graduated from high school. Uh, by then I'd found a place in Springdale that was 120 acres and it had a little old dairy barn on it, and we were able to get it before it would pass grade A, and we started milking there. I don't know how many I was milking, maybe 20, 25, but expanded pretty good and got up to 60 cows there at one point. And they were in stanchions. That's not a lot of fun when you're getting up and down. This was a flat parlor? It was a flat milking barn, six stanchions. We'd have to run around in front of them to feed them while we milked them. And got a little smarter than that since then. I wouldn't, I'd just put some feed in there and let them eat it. But in those days, you weighed the feed down to half a pound, whether you give them 12 pounds or 10 pounds a day or what have you. And never had great supplies of feed. We did a little better after we got to Springdale. But, uh, I only had two excellent animals there for a while. One of them was a bull by Jesse Lewis Bass. And I had acquired from Lion Jerseys in Iowa. No kidding. And uh, he had a couple of full sisters, one that produced the All American, and the older one, Madeline, was first prize four year old at the All American, and she had been grand at Waterloo. That kind of impressed me and they were excited but just to be Noble Lane and I got the full brother San Ysidro jerseys in Colorado bought a full brother and they had the full, full sister Madeline which is sold in the All-American sale for six thousand dollars which in 1958 or 9 was a lot of money but anyway the bull turned out just fine and he became a superior sire and uh, I finally got one really good cow to go 91, and uh, I wasn't getting as many points as I thought I should, so I changed classifiers, and I, they sent another man to classify him who had classified for years, and he scored several excellence. Uh, one was 94, another was 93, and uh, a good two-year-old that I had was, uh, he had scored her 93 and he found out she was a two-year-old, so he had to back her off to 89. But uh, by then I had learned how to find the good animals. And uh, the same time I bought the Jester B that went 94, uh, I bought some other Jester B Noble Lane daughters at the same place in the Holland, Texas, from a man named Bob Gray. And unbeknownst to most of the people in Texas, he had a really good herd of cows. And I was able to get a 94 and two 92s out of there while I was in the Army in active duty at, at Fort Hood. And I know some of that story, and those cows changed the whole Jersey breed for the better. Yeah. Well, those cows were a great start. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was already familiar with the Jester B bulls. And he had done such a good job at the Lions, he really put them on the map. And uh, I went back later and bought some more from Mr. Gray. He, he had dispersed his herd. And prior to the dispersal, the mother of the Jester B was there, and I had already gotten her son by Beauty's Master Besser. And at my request, he bred the bull, bred that cow to Beauty's Master Besser. Then she had a another calf, which was a heifer, by that beauty bull. And that was Burgess Keeper. And I brought the old cow and, and the baby calf to my place. And unfortunately, the, the old cow was, the veterinary called her open and she was actually pregnant. And when we bred her again, she aborted another calf. So wound up being a no-show, no-go on that particular cow. But she was a terrific old cow. And I, I had 
gone to Mr. Grace to see that cow and a note or two that had gone excellent. And a neighbor of his had told me about them. So. Before we get too far into the Burgess Keeper Excellent 96 Foundation of Your Herds and many other herds, let's go back, if you don't mind, to uh, you won the National Youth Achievement Winner. Right. When, how old were you then? I was... Award, I meant. 20, I think. Okay. Had anyone from Arkansas ever won that before? No. Or uh, since? Not that I know of. <laughs> That's a pretty big achievement. And uh, you got to go on a trip as part of that award. Well, the award was $450. And at that time... A youth fair was 50% of the regular fair by air. So I flew from Fayetteville to Cincinnati, Ohio, through St. Louis, of course, and went to Hetherington. And Paul Jackson was the Ohio Jersey rep. And I traveled with him for two or three days and saw uh, several good herds. Uh, Maurice Baird, I think, was there, and maybe Breezy Hill. Uh, Mr. Baird, Brad, uh, Vancer Sleeping Pamela? Yes. Uh, I think Baird's bred Pamela, I'm sure they did. You probably saw a lot of Sleeping Jesters. Oh, yeah. I saw Pamela sometime after that, but on another trip. But uh, my last stop in Ohio was at my Cranston Brothers who had the, well, their their favorite favorite cow at that time was Marlo Commando Etta. She was really a fantastic favorite commando daughter. And uh, later on, they come up with Etta's master babe and her family. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I spent the last night in Cleveland and then flew to Toronto and spent the night, two nights, I think, at the Royal York Hotel. And the Queen Mother of England was there at the same time. Wow. It cost me $22 a night. Now it would probably be two to $300 a night. Or more. It's a five-star hotel or a fabulous place. I've, I've been there three or four times since. But anyway, I visited Donhead Farm, one of the first ones. That was a big herd, wasn't it? It was a, a fairly large herd at that time, and Francis Riedelmeyer was one of the brothers who owned it. And I guess they figured out I was going to spend too much money at the Royal York, so they had loaned me a car to get back and forth. But then they gave me a guest house to stay in for a few days. Pretty nice. Pretty Very nice. Kid from Arkansas. Very nice. And their herd manager was kind of the guy that you saw in Ontario to get around and see things. And he took me around to a number of good herds, uh, uh, Glendale Farm, Edula, Brampton. Big names. Maybe some others. Uh, that was uh, an educational thing in that that part of Canada had all tied to Brampton breeding and had gone a little too far with intensifying Brampton Basilua, which had been an imported cow that became world fat champion. But that was foundation bloodlines for North America. It is. She's probably in 99% of the pedigrees in the world today. <clears throat> she was quite a brood cow. And uh, uh, some of the first Brampton cattle I was aware of were in Arkansas friend of mine who's much kind of a, a mentor to me. I saw her herd when I was just a little kid and she eventually moved almost next door to us. And I, she line bred to Brampton Basilua and she brought in cattle, brought in heifers by Wright Royal sons and bred them to the Brampton Basilua's son. What was her name? Mrs. Musser, Lorraine Musser. But she was, had a great mind for breeding and many other things. She'd been a nurse and a teacher and 
she and her father had a lumber yard. So she's multi-talented. And a horse breeder. Yes, she bred, she grew up the first Arabian horses to Arkansas in probably the 40s. Had some fantastic horses. Uh, of course, Arabian breeders typically inbred them terribly, and she did them. And uh, she they, believed in that. They did that on purpose to develop this? Well, the old, Egypt, the old, old Egyptian theory was, even with people, was people married their own sister and brothers to intensify the strength of the family and to combine the wealth. And they intended to do that with the horses. Okay. And, uh, yeah, actually it was done much of, throughout much of Europe just to keep the wealth together. And they thought since they were... Blue blood. Blue blood that they needed to do that. But uh, she was terrific influence. Uh, I learned a lot about breeding cattle with her. I got the last two or three cows she had that I was able to carry that group of families on till I dispersed. And uh, she always told me to never be afraid of selling a good one because... I remember you told me that years ago. She said, don't be afraid to sell a good one because if you're any good at what you do, you'll have come up with some more. And she said, poorer people are better breeders because they have to succeed and they have to wait. Uh, she said, B.H. Bull and Son, Bartley Bull's one she talked to, had said they had to succeed because they were so poor and in debt they couldn't do otherwise. And of course they Big phenomenally, foundation heard. Yeah. phenomenally successful all over the world. Mm -hmm. Sold tons of cattle. Yeah. They all, and their, one of their theories was in those days they would ship a boxcar load of heifers and a bull or two to communities all over the United States. And he said, we always make sure there's one really good one on the load. And he said, he said part of it was people will remember the good ones and they forget the bad ones. <laughs> well, it's all great advice that you got back when you were very young. Yeah, yeah, I was I was visiting Ms. Musser from the time I was 14 till I was about 20. And uh, I didn't even go see her after that. She relocated. And uh, I'd go see her there, and she wound up in a nursing home. And I went to see her there and during the last stages of her life. Brilliant woman. Sounds like it. Um, Butterfield Farm, the name, how did you come up with that? The farm we acquired in Springdale was on the Overland, but the Butterfield Overland Stagecoach Road. Wow. And That goes uh, way back. It kind of matched jerseys. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because we had fields of, of butter running around out there. Yeah. And uh, it's great. I like that. It uh, it gave us kind of an instant recognition. Mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody knew what it really meant, but. I never knew. Uh, the first catalog we ever printed, or I think it was the first one, we had a picture of an Overland States coach on the cover of that catalog. I probably have one around somewhere if I could find it. But. That's cool. I never made that connection until today. Um, and then you got married, bought your own farm, and moved away from your folks' farm. That's right. And then that became the Butterfield Farm that everybody knows. Right. <clears throat> which is east of Bentonville along Little Sugar Creek. Beautiful farm. Uh, you and I went there a month or two ago. Right. And uh, for old time's sake, that was a lot of fun. Uh, creek ran through the farm, uh, land on both sides of the road. Yeah, the creek ran a mile through the place. Place is a mile long, about three quarters wide. A little over 400 acres. Big, beautiful farmhouse. It's a gorgeous place. Uh, it wasn't a farmer's farm, really. Uh, I thought I'd have acres and acres I could put in corn and make silage, but I found more, out right quick I couldn't do that. It was more of a gravel bottom, wasn't it? It was a gravel bottom and creek overflowed at times. Mm -hmm. 
got really spooky. But it looked beautiful when all those hundreds of jerseys were out there. It did. Uh, I can remember that easily. I remember Neil Smith saying one time that he said, ain't none of the rest of them got anything like this. <laughs> yeah, very picturesque. And Chase Wilson was there once and with his wife and daughter. and His daughter was talking to about uh, how pretty it was. And Chase's wife said, honey, it's all downhill from now. <laughs> they were headed to the deep south to look at some famous herds. Yeah. And some of those were pretty rusty. <laughs> yep, I agree. Well, that's going to about wrap up our first uh, video. I guess since I've got this, I had you put this trophy right here front and center. We should tell the folks what that's for. That's well, that's been a keepsake. I think I've had some other trophies and awards prior to that, but that being a model Jersey cow that was presented to me, I believe in uh, 69 or uh, 50, so 61 or 61, two. It says, yeah. It's a 61 con uh, contest. And I had won the uh, American Jersey Cattle Club's Jersey Youth Achievement Contest. And that was presented at the annual meeting, if I remember correctly. Okay. Very cool. And um, you didn't just go to Canada on that trip. Is that right? Did you continue back no, into I, the States? I had uh, con a continuing experience. Uh, uh, Francis Riedelmeyer uh, let me ride with him to Heaven Hill Farm in New York. We visited that farm, saw a few famous cows there. Uh, then went on to the animating in Woodstock, Vermont. Uh, met a lot of interesting, outstanding people in the breed at that trip. Well, did, did you go to the Billings Farm? Uh, I'm pretty sure I did. I don't remember it precisely. I don't remember any of the herds in Vermont really making an impression on me, but we after the annual meeting we were to go to Massachusetts, and I rode with Mr. Riedelmeyer and Henry Canale and his wife was along. We went through New Hampshire and kind of got lost on the way, but we made it to uh, Assembly Farm. And I think it was Lynn, Massachusetts, and uh, they had. A big feed, lobster feed, they called it a clam bake for it looked like 600 people. It's a huge turnout. I wasn't really impressed with the cattle that much, but they they had been there a long time and they sold bottled milk, I believe. But uh, I think that was probably the first real lobster I ever got a hold of. Kind of got me hooked. I think maybe I had two of them, but. Anyway, went on from that to Worcester, Mass, spent the night with an aunt and uncle, then flew out of there to New York, and uh, people from Marlow Farm picked me up, took me to Marlow, uh, stayed at the Molly Pitcher Inn in Red Bank, New Jersey, where Marlow Farm always put their guests. I got to pay for it, though. They didn't pay the bill. <laughs> And I got to see the Marlou herd. Uh, and I believe that was the trip where we saw the first Mallory Milestone daughters. And they would have been about three year olds. Uh, they were pretty impressive. The whole operation there was impressive. Uh, Curtis, the manager, was a fantastic man, Curtis Hobson. Mm -hmm. And uh, I Stayed friends with him for a long time. Saw him again at Mayfields. On that same trip, I went back and saw the Mayfield herd. Wow. And I believe the Happy Valley Farm in Rossville, Georgia. Georgia. Came back to Memphis and went to the Shelby County Penal Farm, which I guess had been there from the 1800s. But everything was perfectly spick and span. They had plenty of labor. And uh, they had these long one-story barns, green roofs, white. And they had a 
cows faced out and they had a, a cart that rolled down the middle that had the milking machine on it and a place to put the milk. That's the way they milk cows. And uh, they had a, at one time they had Estella's Volunteer there, I believe, which was one of the premier production bred sires all time. And uh, it was still a pretty good herd of cows. But the fellow that was showing us around said they had fellows there that had been in jail for a long time and all they ever did was milk cows there. And when they got out, they'd commit some crime so they could come back. Couldn't find a better place to be that than there. Apparently a great place for them. Mm -hmm. and I can kind of understand that. It, milking cows is a little like being in jail, except <laughs> in jail you don't normally have to milk cows. I wasn't going to say that, but I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, you came back home? Yeah, then I flew on home. And I, I had spent about 50 bucks over my $450. That's amazing. Boy, sure yeah. can't fly around the country or Canada like that. Can't now. go very far now. You can go to, you can, from here, you can go to Denver for $35. But I don't think that'll last long. <laughs> um, all right. I think we're going to wrap up this video at that. And, uh, this is the end of part one with Roger Mabry in Rogers, Arkansas. Thanks, Roger. You're quite welcome.